Um, my name is Helen Berry and I'm a member of the steering group for Great Months to Housing Futures, which is an action research partnership looking at what community-led housing has to offer in situations of neighbourhood decline and gentrification, specifically in the context of Great Manchester. Um, so this is the fourth event and our three events since April have looked in turn at housing cooperatives, co-housing and at community land trusts which are the main models we refer to when, when we talk about forms of housing which are community-led. Housing Futures is producing a desk-based review of existing knowledge, as well as undertaking primary research, in order to make a series of stakeholder-specific recommendations in a report to be launched in December this year. We have also been feeding into the Greater Manchester Housing Strategy Review, which is being led by the Salford City Mayor, Paul Dennis, who will be speaking at our report launch on Saturday, the 8th of December. Over the last year, we've also been building a local network of groups and organisations around community-led housing, and we're working with a small consortium of organisations to set up a regional hub for Greater Manchester, which will be able to offer advice, support, um, and support groups to access the Community Housing Fund and to sign both into further support. The first meeting um, of that hub, which will be at the Cooperative Consortium, um, will be at our launch event in December. Um, and in parallel, we'll then have workshops for, for other interested parties and members of the community. When you arrived, you should have picked up some information about this and about our other remaining events, which is taking place on the 1st of November, and that will be looking at what countries in the Global South can teach us about how to do successful community-led housing. The other paper I'm going to share details support being offered by the Great Manchester Combined Authority to community-led housing projects, which are located in any of the 10 boroughs. So if you have a spark of an idea, or belong to an existing co-op or, or community which could expand um, with the right of advice or finance being available, please use the link on that sheet to get in touch with this project, um, which will in turn link with the, with the Greater Manchester Hub when that is up and running. Um, and also, I just wanted to mention that given the audience in this room, um, some of you might also want to use that link to offer your services um, as a paid advisor. So turning to the plan for this evening, which we have um, designed in order to place the evidently rapidly growing interest in community-led housing into a wider political context, um, and invited uh, three speakers tonight, um, who are um, Rebecca Lomnady, who's the MP for Salford and Ethel, and Shadow Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, with the longer title, I think, in um, and she, along with John McDonnell, commissioned the Alternative Models of Ownership report in the title of tonight's meeting, which has generated so much interest since it was launched in June last year. Then we'll have here Neil McEnroy, who's the Chief Executive of the Centre for Local Economic Strategies, often referred to just as CLEB, um, and he's a leading commentator on public policy matters and one of the contributors to the, to the Alternative Models of Ownership report. And then finally, finally we'll hear from our housing expert, Stephen Hill, who is chair of the UK Co-Housing Network and a board member of the National Community Land Trust Network, and who has 40 years of direct involvement in the development of policy and practice around the self-organised housing sector and community-led neighbourhood regeneration. There'll be a, um, time for a few questions, probably not to Rebecca because she has to leave and go to another meeting. Um, and then we'll move into a panel and audience debate where, um, as chair, I'll put in a series of questions to Stephen and Neil based on key issues arising from our research so far, and then invite you all to participate in that. At 8.30, we'll need to wrap up, but the discussions can continue at the Moon Under the Water pub for anyone who'd like to join us there afterwards. That's the weather screen the other side of the of St. Peter's Square, so you can just follow the group if you don't know where that is. Um, lastly, if the fire alarm goes off, we'll need to leave calmly through here, um, and you will find um, toilets out in the foyer near, on the right near where the tea and coffee um, were spread. So, I'm going 
going to hand over directly to you, Rebecca, and she's going to um, talk to us about
um, under a Labour government, and at least half of those are going to be council homes. Well, that won't be enough, and we know that we need to look at other models, other cures to help us navigate through this difficult time. And we also need to recognise that until we do have a Labour government, and please God that will be soon, but we need to prepare ourselves locally and take as much action as we possibly can, which is why I'm so pleased at the initiatives that have been put forward tonight. Now there are many alternatives to private ownership, not just in regard to housing, but also in relation to business and industry, from the local level to the national level. But in order to do this, we've got to address the big challenges facing the economy. We've got to confront the, long -term, the lack of long-term investment and tackle stagnant productivity. And another staggering statistic that I like to quote is that we're in a period of stagnation in relation to productivity. We've not experienced a period like this since just after the Napoleonic Wars, even before we even had industrial revolutions that we, that we go to the Museum of Science and Industry and look at. And that's absolutely <coughs> staggering. We really are in the midst of a productivity crisis. So we've got to reset our economy, but we can't just reset it and improve that productivity and put it in the hands of a wealthy few. We've got to make sure that it's put back into the hands of the many, not the few. And that's why the discussion about alternative models of ownership is so important. Now it's not right, economically effective or socially just that the profits extracted from vital public services continue to line the pockets of shareholders. This obsession with big business being able to run everything is an illusion. And we saw that this year with the collapse of Carillion, how the rug was pulled not only from under public services, but across businesses in our region. Those smaller businesses in the supply chain who relied on Carillion providing them work, late payments up to 160 days in many cases. There was no social responsibility on the part of Carillion to deliver those public services, and the government had to step in and try and mitigate the crisis that was caused. So there's an increasing acceptance that instead of improving the efficiency of public service provision, privatisations damaged service quality and facilitated the ciphering of public money for profit. Now we know, you know, I'm probably preaching to the converted, but we know that many of these services will be better run when they're directly accountable to the public, in the hands of the workforce responsible for their frontline delivery and in the interest of the people who use and rely on them. Yet the Tory government continues to deny this and continues to pursue a model of private property ownership to the exclusion of everything else. It doesn't matter that it's more economically viable or cost effective to provide a service within the public sector, whether that be housing or clinical services within the NHS. There's this pursuit of privatisation, an ideological agenda that drives this, that isn't in the interest of many of our public services and many of our communities. There are fundamental flaws that flow directly from the predominance of private property ownership which undermine the economic strength and well-being of our society. And these deep structural flaws won't be resolved gradually or fixed through technocratic policies. We've got to look ahead and come up with radical new solutions. We need a fresh approach and that means investigating who owns our economy and asking, actually, in whose interest is it run? As well as exploring ways in which we can improve it by working together. So it's therefore necessary that we examine a variety of models of ownership going forward and to, uh, to control productive enterprises, not to you know, push business out. And I always make the point that we're diversifying our business environment and those public services that we know will be run in the collective interest of the public, should be run in the collective interest of the public, and the public should have a hand in deciding how those services themselves are run. One example of collective ownership, uh, collective ownership itself has the ability to increase employment stability and increase productivity levels. It also ensures that firms are more democratic and guarantees that economic prosperity is not concentrated in certain regions of the country. I was talking about public services generally, and slightly kind of going off topic from, the, from housing here. Well, there's a lot of discussion in relation to Labour's nationalisation plans to bring certain uh, public services back into public ownership. And what I want to reiterate to people is that constantly 
in the press we hear will be taken back to the 1970s, that there'll be a shadowy organisation at the top that controls everything, whether it's water, rail, housing, and all the rest of it. That is not what's central to our agenda. Democracy is what's central to our agenda. And around the world we're seeing examples of the positive contributions of national ownership and the different models that are available. But in the UK, national state ownership has historically tended to be centralised, which is why people make these assumptions. And the power has been placed in the hands of a private and sometimes corporate elite. But we've said quite clearly that we're committed to bringing rail, energy, water and mail back into public ownership. But we're also committed to putting democratic management at the heart of how these industries are run. And there's a piece of work ongoing at the moment in relation to democracy, which hopefully you'll all be able to get involved in in due course when it's announced, where we're asking Labour members and people as part of the wider Labour and cooperative movement to dictate to us what would they like to see in terms of democratic ownership going forward. How do they think they should have a stake in those public organisations so that they can make sure that they're as fair, transparent and as efficient as they possibly can be. Now, we're hungry for a new economic model, one which prioritises the shared value of collective goals, which is why we want to catapult into 21st century public ownership. And it's not just a case of looking at, you know, renationalisation in the old form, cooperatives in one particular genre. This is about examining all of the new and radical forms of public ownership. And I know you're going to hear from some fantastic speakers tonight. But ultimately, underpinning all of that is about making sure that we don't have an economy that's run in the interests of the few. We have an economy that represents the interests of the many, whether it be housing, making sure that people feel that they have that security, that they as a community can control investment in their housing area and dictate what their community should be enjoying, whether it's in relation to automation, because that's a big issue on the agenda at the moment. Do we make sure that you know, the profits of particular industries are increasingly siphoned into the pockets of shareholders? Or do we make sure that automation through public ownership actually benefits those who work in those companies? That they can go to shorter working weeks if productivity increases and efficiency increases due to these technological changes. We won't be able to do any of that unless we discuss these different forms of ownership. And I don't think we're going to do that tonight. And I'm sorry that I'm going to miss the rest of the contributions, but it sounds like it's going to be a very exciting event. Uh, but just to say, I am so pleased that we are leading on this in Greater Manchester. We've always done that. Whenever there's a problem and we haven't got what we want from government, we always try to find out what we can do ourselves. And we're renowned for that in Greater Manchester. And that makes me proud to be a Salfordian and a Greater Mancunian. Thanks very much. <laughs> relevant um, tax 
you know, um, offshore place that they've registered themselves in. And that's why we're doing an awful lot of work on tax avoidance and forcing this, you know, register of interests and ownership within these tax dependencies so that we are in a position to be able to find out who landlords are so that if they are, aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing or local authorities need to intervene in some way, they'll at least know who to get in touch with. And another example of that is on the high street, we've got, you know, empty shops, for example. And one thing that you know we've suggested from the Labour Party is that there should be, and this has been advocated by different reviews, the Grimsey, second Grimsey review on the High Street talked about this, Mary Portis, member with the ginger hair who did the High Street Town Centre stuff, she talked about this, about making a, a register of landlords so that local authorities have a clear register of landlords and it's like a legal right to report that you own particular properties. So if it's empty, it's dilapidated, um, it can be used for other uses, for example, the local authority or whoever else might be interested will be able to directly engage with that landlord and do something about it. But well, that takes direct action from government and then we'd have to legislate to do that. You can't expect these things to just happen voluntarily because they're not, are they? Yeah. Um, on the subject of empty houses, uh, for example, right now there's 226 empty houses at night, bundled up, have been for 12 months. Annoys me to the back seat because I'm constantly trying to have five houses for your people. Yeah. I, you don't see the local authority very keen on using the empty owners' property powers or, or compulsory purchase because it costs their money, it's too much. Yeah. I want to see the Labour government say we will give charities, housing properties and non-profits the right to apply to the courts if something's been empty for longer than 12 months to get an order on it, to take it over. Yeah, and that's about the local authority. Because the local authority don't have the funding, they don't have the interest, they don't have the will. Yeah. So let's give the sector the wants to do it, the legal right to go we want to do it, give us. No, I completely agree, and it's something that John Healy, our shadow housing person, has been working on. And I'm not the expert on these things, but I know that there, there is an examination of this use it or lose it principle. So if there are boarded up properties for a long period of time, then there is the opportunity. Uh, I'm not sure if it extends to housing associations, but I'll check that point, so don't quote me on that, but I'll feed it back to John. Thanks, we've probably got, we've got time for one very quick point. If you, if there's, there's a lot of anger um, in um, Salford in particular um, because, um, um, because of the fact that um, the um, Salford City Council, um, the councillors and the land officers in particular are seen to be in bed um, with the um, private um, property developers. Um, and in point of fact, I think um, the University of Manchester um, did have an event um, a week ago which looked at how um, urban, uh, well, de developer-led urban regeneration um, has more or less been given a free hand, um, particularly in Salford, um, which has led to a lot of inappropriate development um, and um, uh, of very expensive housing um, that has ended up pricing out um, Salford locals <coughs> I mean, so much so that now the um, average price of a house in Salford is 137,000. Um, and I think the Salford Star did run a very recent article saying that a, a nurse on a starting salary of 23,000 will have to save for 17 years to get a deposit on a first time house. Um, so and, your, well, how is Labour going to win that trust back? Because the Labour Council has allowed development-led regeneration to take place in Salford, and there are a lot, there are a lot of people on the ground who are very angry and who are prepared to pull the Labour Council out, yeah. and then they will. Yeah, I mean, in, in Salford, I think the issue that we've got, obviously, I can't speak for the spokesperson for the council. So obviously, I'm not, you know, from the council itself. Well, the issue that we've got is that we have seen a lot of development, a lot of flats around the Keys and in Ottawa, and people living nearby see all of these, you know, fantastic new flats kind of springing up, and they see very little happening in their communities. They don't see social housing being built in their communities. And, you know, what I would say is that I'm not against, you know, new developments, fantastic flats, 
but at the same time we have to have social housing and what we need is a massive bold and radical council house building programme and we need to fund local authorities and housing associations and cooperative projects such as this one to be able to do that and we're not seeing that from government at the moment and we're in a situation where you know as i said earlier we're trying to make the best of a bad situation and come up with ideas for community-led projects we shouldn't have to do that because there should be a massive fund provided by government to deal with this housing crisis thanks very much
who are trying to change things. They're doing things in spite of the system. And what we say is, why don't we have a system that supported it? We'd be cooking on gas. So I'm optimistic. There's a growing consciousness that come out in the global financial crisis. It kind of, the, the mass slip. Nobody's in charge. The whole thing's a mess. <laughs> the mass slip, and we're all going, ah! Well, some of us can do that anyway, but, but mainstream people are going, oh, make no means people. They make everyone in the knows, you know. Even my brother who's a Tory kind of knows it. <laughs> yeah, he's going, oh, that's no good, they're bankers. I would tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so there's a growing consciousness, and that's a growing thing. And we're at the end, the beginning of your heart. You know, that's the first uh, Churchill quote and only one uh, in the beginning. Uh, uh, so people are fighting back. There's movements across lots of the environmental movements, housing movements, uh, 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 economic movements, co-op movements. They're all growing, and they're all getting people coming around and rallying. People are no longer tolerating the intolerable. Oh no. So, we're also worth saying that we're in this uh, uh, interregnum. There's another funny word for what this other Interregnum. Who knows what interregnum is? I've got a watch, I don't know where it is myself. Uh, interregnum is a space where there's something about me born. But it's not born yet. But it, it's something that's kind of starting to emerge, but it's no right to be formed. It's a paradigm shift moment, a zone of transition. Gramsci talked about this interregnum, uh, Italian communist. We're in that moment. We are in the interregnum. All these little sins are coming together, but they're not quite together yet. And that's how we need movements like this, because it's starting to bring people together and ideas together so we can actually create something that is the new. The defining issue, I think, that underpins this, what this conversation here is about wealth and ownership. And I'm fascinated by wealth. Who has it? Where does it go? And how do we get our hands on it? And for all the great work that gets done in poverty, we know poverty. Oh man, it's... You just put you know, studies of poverty, boom, millions of stuff. We've no dimension, shapes, where it is, who has it? What poverty? Wealth? <coughs> No idea. It's, it's hidden. So, wealth is the defining uh, quality of an economy and what the movement what we're trying to do wealth and ownership. And there's fascinating things about wealth. Where does it go? Here, this city. Lots of wealth. Where does it go? There's a Scottish phrase, scoosh. It means sliding a wall. It scooshes away. It's, it, where does it go, all that wealth? Well, it's going to speculators, investors, off, off, off the Cayman Islands, shareholders. None of them probably here. It's not hitting the streets of you, Lord God, and it's scooching them up. You need to make that stick. Okay? And that's how different forms of ownership that's linked to that place, linked to the people, linked to the hearts of people, that's how we counteract that wealth that scooches eh, a lot. Um, there's five things in picking the issue of wealth. First is growth is people say, don't you economic development, economic development, economic development people say, growth, trickle down, we know that doesn't work, yeah. Growth goes up, poverty is a bit like that. Growth is detached from poverty. They're not connected, they're disconnected. So we need to link it up. There's some mental facts say the ten richest men, men in the world own the same amount of wealth as fifty percent of the poorest. So it's 10 men in the same amount is 3.5 billion. 10% uh, of the richest in Britain hold 50% of all the wealth. The poorest 50% only hold 9% of the wealth of the UK. And 1% own more than 20 times the wealth of the poorest 20%. This is not just law, it's a bit bad, isn't it? It's an abomination. The reason why there's poverty is because wealth's been extracted at an unprecedented level by a few. And we need to stop that. We need to make reservoirs, locks and burns that make sure that wealth flows through people's lives. And that's where things like community housing comes in. People say, traditional left people say, oh yeah, it's, it's really made the welfare state and redistributed through tax. 
Kaj zvej pilo, da te lašo vagu. Na zvej pa ti duro, pa je ubi enof. And you know why? Because capitalism is matured. When the welfare state was uh, formed, we knew, where the, we knew where capitalism was. We knew how to tax it. We knew where they were. And there was a contract built between citizens, the state, and business. Corporation tax was paid readily. Businesses have hearts too, of course. Now, we're in an era of neo-liberalism, market liberalism, where we easily don't know where the capitalists are. Yeah. And align with the state that extracting the wealth. So we can't just say, oh, let's just have redistribute policy and that will be enough. No, we need to go even deeper. We need to actually create an economy which functions virtuously, not just to get growth and then you redistribute it. The very act of how the economy works needs to be closer to our hearts. And that's where community led housing comes in. Unionisation has been eviscerated. Uh, the lack of collective bargaining, all that's a problem with wealth too. Uh, Rebecca touched upon it. The labour market. I was in a big distribution centre recently in Scotland. One of those distribution centres, you know, you're driving past it, you go, oh, there's that. And like two minutes later, you're still driving past it. Massive big shed, right? Something huge. And I had one of these tours. Sorry. And this, yeah, see robots moving about. Okay. Ask the guy who was showing us a tour. I thought you were R&D for the different types of robots. And he goes, oh yeah, we've got a great plans for more robots. Yeah, we're going to have to make that bit and this bit. And I'm going, oh, you'll be like employing less staff then for the people to fight. Yeah. And he goes, oh no, oh, no, 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 no. Of course there will. There's going to be less jobs. Now, traditionally, money has come to us through the wages. If there's no any jobs, how do we get wealth? We're going to have to be own more of the means of production. Otherwise, we're going to be poor people in perpetuity and misery in perpetuity. It's not just a political project, it's a social necessity for decency to have own a more a plural set of ownership of the means of production. And again, this is where community housing is so important. Planning. Planning. Planning used to be a tool to create great places. It was an enabling context where Pat McGuinness, the Scottish planner, he's seen places as systems and you need to all the things connected to create great places. And he was a planner. Planning now is a tool to facilitate capital to come in and for capital to leave. It's a, it, it, it's a, it's a vehicle for, cap, for, for capital and investment. So planning is fundamentally important. We need to change how planning uh, functions. So two questions. One is traditional re redistribution. Yeah, I think we need to think about that, but it's limited. We need to think about a more profound ownership of the economy. Not after the fact of growth. Not a social contract that this is the big thing that's going right on and we just the poor people. Something that's much, much more powerful with more deeper community and local ownership of certain elements within the economy. We need more entrance into the market because at the moment it's fundamentally right. It's right in favour of the few. We need to have this plurality of forms to allow um, the diversity of human life, but also to ensure that there's not one monolithic process that extracts uh, the wealth. Local is important here. This, you know, in a global world, global, global, the global economy is, well, globalisation is a good thing in terms of us being interconnected with lots of people around the world. Yeah? The global economy isn't, though, because it serves just a few. The local really matters. And what I love about the local is, it, 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 it conflates some of the things. It means there's an authenticity. There's a chance for people to bump and mingle and share and collaborate and commune. The local is a very important thing here. You can, there's an identity that comes from local. There's an authenticity that comes from local. So an economy that has a, 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 a more of a local element to it, that counteract that global economy, I think is very important. Also, Democracy is important. <coughs> democracy itself has become 
new a tool for global corporations to utilise. We need to bring democracy back home as well. Ada Calau in Barcelona, the mayor of Barcelona, if we do some work, she says, politics is an agora, not a temple. She means that politics is a space that we all come into, not the town hall. Yeah. Democracy is something um, that we do, not that we, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's something that we engage in, not something we just do in terms of our ballot box. So this idea of politics and democracy is so fundamentally important as well. <coughs> How much time have we got? Is it alright? Or am I adding on? What was that? Right. Oh, right. I get that peasant Scott thing. I say this all the time. You know, you we we put our shoulder says you're shy. You know. <laughs> you know, it's a horrible thing. It's a cross you've got there, but it's better than being a glorious bastard, isn't it? So, I'm going to just talk about a little bit about loan market clients uh, very briefly on a local wealth problem. You probably heard the pressing model. Yeah, but who said the pressing model? I'm sick of the back teeth here. <laughs> <laughs> six years' work, uh, trying to get people interested in it for six years, and all of a sudden, one Guardian article with everybody's fucking flooding in. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I was on. So, to so much so, I was on the Jeremy Vine show a few weeks ago. What the Jeremy Vine show? <laughs> what? Followed by a Bumby's Python. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Vine's a nice guy, actually, I want to say. I've been being this now. I know Jeremy Vine. Uh, anyway, uh, that, that whole work, and it's not just Preston. Preston's been covered. We're now working in Cuddley's, Birmingham, Oldham, Salford, London Borough, Islington, Wirral, 10 European cities. Barcelona. We're also working with NHS England and the Health Foundation, looking at the power of health institutions as anchors. How workforce, supply chains, how can we make sure that is virtuously social in the economy? So it's a growing movement, I don't want to um, bang on about that, but there's one key thing to that movement. It's new municipalism. It's, it's a sense that there's a local authorities, local areas, saying we are going to um, Create an economy that works for the people. Barcelona is the, is the poster child of this, so you need to go on this big time here as well. Final thing is, is it, how do we get a movement to grow? And that's important as well. Come over there today. Um, we need to know who to blame. I get audience like this, people speak to it, and it's like, yeah, it's a city council, why just city council bastards? Combined authority. Or, it's like, or you say like, hey, oh it's that, they bought that RSL, bought it home, nasty. Or well, that, yeah, yeah. It's not them, it's not them, it's the system, it's the market and big government. It's them to blame. So when you're trying a movement, you need to be very careful about who you start to blame. Certainly somebody's just going through the motions and going back and we need to call that out, but call out the real people that blame, which is the market. Imagine City Council's doing best in a crap situation. So soft. I don't think you should blame them. Blame the real people. Blame the new liberals. Don't blame them. They're just trying their best in a crap situation. Third one is, second thing is the trigger. The tr in our movement, in the dressing work, it's been like, the trigger is this dawning realisation that there's injustices being done. There's something really intolerable being done. And that trigger, when you see that thing, and people, you see other people get interested in that thing that people get annoyed at, jump at it, because that's the, that's the medium, that's the, that's the entry point to your movement. The, 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 the real burning sense of injustice, homelessness work. The third one is evidence. What's the true story here? Go beyond the injustice, but how is it manifest? What's the causes is important? So we've got who to blame, blame the right people, the trigger, evidence, and collaboration. The lesson for precedent in new municipalism is this is not about vainglorious leadership. And the means to a movement are important as the end, they infect the ends. And if you're a movement for social change, it's no Hannah or Isaac or somebody saying, here is the way forward. It's everyone. It's, it's, it's suspension of hubris in this leadership and I know one, the big man or woman. 
Yeah, it's about solidarity, collaboration, and working with your brother and sister. That has to be the means that we hold dear. And some so-called progressives, usually in London and usually ranty leftovers, left wing, sometimes I'm suspicious of them because I think actually your your ego's too big, mate. Calm your ego down and let other people in. Yeah. And, and, and England's plagued by that. There's something in England here in the eye said that just looks look for the big leader. Maybe it's Henry the fifth thing, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, the fifth thing is patience. You don't you don't stop the juggernaut by waving in front of it saying stop, because it'll run you over. You've got to slow that juggernaut down bit by bit, then eventually you can get in the caveat and drive it somewhere else and break it up and create something different. You won't, you, you've, got, you've got to have patience with this. Press with six, what years what? Sixth thing to say is, we need traction. And Labour have now set up the Community Wealth Building Unit. Um, I think that's really uh, important. I think we need this wider context, and that's how Peter and Rebecca tonight for that con contextual frame. The final thing I would say is that, very finally, that there's a guy called Roberto Lunga, who's a Brazilian philosopher and politician. Roberto Lunga says, this is the age of experiments in this interregnum. It's trying stuff. Trying it, getting small wins. I was speaking to Steve there earlier. Get that, get that, get that little housing thing you're trying. Go in and work it. Two, four, five, six units. Get it going. And sing to the rooftops about it. Yeah? Showcase it. And then that experiment will grow. It, 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 it's, a, it's a tipping point. It'll be exponential. That's try stuff. And I see in this moment what we are, we've got all this horizontal energy, yeah? Lots of plural people doing great stuff as part of this movement. Where we are in the theory of change at this point in time is this is starting to grow, but vertical power is not yet been affected. We need to do more and more of this and then root vertical power to it, and then we're really yesterday. We're not there yet, but that would be a whole. Thanks so much for listening. Well, that's helpful.
about why they were collaborating to do community housing projects. What was in it for the politicians in a country where mostly American politicians don't have anything to do with affordable housing or state-provided housing, the market decides everything. Um, and for communities um, in a country where there has always been much more autonomous community and citizen action, what were they getting out of it through their collaborations? My very first evening, uh, I arrived late in Boston, three hours late, I had to go straight to a public meeting with people I'd never met before, with all my baggage for uh, two months of travel, um, in a not terribly salubrious part of South Boston. Um, so I had no idea what I was going to. When I arrived, um, this was a big public meeting, and essentially it was a kind of talk show for people who were soon to be homeless. There was an organization called Vida Urbana, City Life, um, which basically provided a place where people who were about to be made homeless through eviction or foreclosure on their homes, um, and it was a place where they could come and tell their stories. And so the members of the audience would come up, tell their story about what was happening to them in their lives, and at the end of it, they are then uh, connected with uh, advisors from Harvard Law School to see how they can at least make their landlords or their mortgage companies go through due process so they're not out on the street tomorrow. Um, but in some cases, postpone the eviction, postpone the foreclosure. Um, now, I'm actually going to give this sort to Neil. So you are one of these people um, who has just told their story. And the compare at the end of the storytelling and before the person goes off the platform to get their help is challenged. Will you fight to stay in your home? Yes! Yeah. <laughs> now you all shout and we will fight with you. So can we do that again? Will you fight to stay in your home? Yes! And we will fight with you. Right. I'm going to have another chance to do that at the end. Right? I want a bit more. Okay. Uh, but the important thing about that event was that the kind of people who were there were just people like you. They were black, they were white, they were middle class, they were working class, they were young, they were old. Um, people in employment, people uh, past working age, all in situations where their lives were very precarious and were being ruthlessly exploited by either the landlord or the mortgage company. Mortgage lending is much less regulated in the States than it is here. And what I got from talking to people in the audience was a sense that that all the lessons of the financial crisis in 2007 had not been learned. Mm -hmm. So although these mortgage companies had, you know, had their fingers burnt with the foreclosure crisis, um, when things came back to normal a bit, they had worked out that they could play the system much more effectively than ever before. Mm -hmm. And essentially, all of us here in this room, and people like us around the world, we are the assets. We are their assets. Because without our name on the mortgage contract or the tenancy, there is nothing to exploit. The moment we are in occupation, we are the asset that can be exploited. Mm -hmm. So mortgage lenders typically <coughs> tend to recover their debt, but the way in which they force people through repossession processes means they end up with all the equity as well. Mm -hmm. It's a ruthlessly exploitative system. Mm -hmm. And it was real eye which really coloured all the rest of my visit to the States um, and the things that were uh, happening there. Um, so um, over on the, on the west coast, um, Oakland City, just over the uh, bay from San Francisco, not a desperately attractive city, and up until now been kind of rather work a day place, but now it's a city where it's receiving loads of people, um, ordinary middle class people, who can no longer afford to live in a much wealthier San Francisco. But the immediate effect of the foreclosure crisis was a moving in by three or four international vulture funds. Now, all these little sort of homey notices about um, housing you see on lampposts uh, uh, and, and telegraph poles and things, these are all basically, they all go back to about three companies which ruthlessly exploited all the people who were in trouble, bought up properties, started investing them up to wealthier incomes from San Francisco um, and were displacing mostly um, African Americans from poorer neighborhoods and repopulating them with better old people and then ultimately selling them off at a huge profit. So the housing market, it's a war out there.
That's what they say in the States. Um, we would say, oh, that doesn't happen here. <laughs> um, yeah. um, so here we are, in London, overheard recently in London. One surveyor says to the other, busy? Busy? So busy? And basically he's busy making money for developers, making sure they don't have to pay uh, for affordable housing in their planning applications. And the two people who run this are a charter surveyor and a charter planner. And the little thing that you end up with at the end is go on a nice holiday with the money you save. Um, now, I'm a surveyor too. I think this is a, a disgrace. I think this is a fraud against the public interest. Um, this website has now changed, and box six now says, and now you can get on with the project. <laughs> <laughs> That's not where they started. Here again, big projects um, in central London, Haygate Estate, some of you probably heard, the heart of Elephant and Castle, um, a lot of community resistance there. And at one stage, one of the people who was resisting the CPA on his lease on flat insisted on seeing the viability calculations which made the whole development uh, justified. And he found that it was not possible to get it. He went to the Information Commission and the High Court, eventually got a decision. And it turned out that not only had nobody in the public ever seen this, none of the councils <laughs> had seen it either. So what were they doing in their democratic world? Um, on the left here, Shell Centre, um, uh, a very large development, so big that it was outside the scope of the local plan when the planning application went in, had to go to a local public inquiry. Um, and a campaigner um, on this subject about biomass and planning um, was challenging uh, the developer on the amount of money he said he could afford to pay for the land. He was paying for a little bit, but really not very much at all. Um, and uh, the QC for the developer was saying, oh no, we really haven't got enough money. During the course of the hearing, uh, this campaigner received anonymously a PowerPoint of a presentation by the developer to city investors. And one of the things you do um, when you do your plan appraisal is you calculate how much money you're going to make from selling one of your properties. So there was one figure in the planning documents, and rather unsurprisingly, there was another figure in the PowerPoint to investors. Would anyone like to hazard a guess about how big the difference was? <laughs> 20,000. Huh? 20,000. 20? 20,000 bigger. Uh, well, just, just kind of an amount of money. Million pounds? Two million. More? More? Huh? 50 million? 300 million. Um, and the QC jumped up. Of course they did. They were. These are the tenants and how they were displaced to all sorts of other parts of the borough. There's another map for leaseholders whose compensation meant that most of them have had to move right to the very edge of London or outside London altogether. Um, uh, another big estate regeneration project. This is um, redevelopment of uh, the Oscourt Exhibition Centre in a big area around there. Hammersmith and Fulham Council, when they were under Tory control, sold an option to the developers Kafka on two estates for £100 million, pounds, which means the developer can call for those two estates to be emptied any time it's choosing in the next 20 years. It's a complete political disgrace. The tenants here have mounted a kind of counteraction. They're trying to exercise the right to transfer regulation so they become the landlord of their own estate. Um, it's a complicated story, I won't go into it now, but in the sense that the campaign has meant that actually they are now in a very strong position. So they've been doing a lot of, we will not be moved. This is a bit like New York in the 1950s, Robert Moses um, and City Council clearing a lot of areas, we will not be moved. Um, and the people around here saying, or Spear, who was a property developer, or Hemsley, and if you've got really sharp eyesight, or Trump, uh, Trump Senior. Um, but the point is that by maintaining a campaign, lobbying both central government and the new Labour Council, um, and with the market having now turned in London, this developer is in real trouble um, and is looking for a way out. So the community have, by sustaining their action, have helped contribute to the discomfort of the 
of the developer, because any other investor is very wary about now getting involved. Um, on a much more positive note, this is another project in London, an NHS hospital site. I'm sure you've got big NHS sites here. Um, NHS uh, Mental Health Trust needed to sell part of their site in order to reprovide um, better facilities on the other half. They got permission for 450 homes, being the most that they and the council thought they could get away with without getting more of local position. Um, but only 14% have affordable housing. The community said 14% is not enough. Um, they started their alternative plan, started the St Anne's Redevelopment Trust. They came up with a proposal for 800 homes with at least 75% affordable housing. Um, and they then mounted a political campaign to persuade the mayor of London to buy the site from the NHS, which they did in this March. Um, he's got a plan for 50% affordable housing. Communities say that's still not good enough. So the campaign goes on. But the point is that whatever happens, there's going to be more affordable housing. And that community campaign created the political space in which something different could happen. Um, so what's special about community-led housing? Well, it's a direct witness for policy and market failure people are experiencing. People are very preoccupied with genuine and permanent affordability for their community. Uh, yeah. It's also about people taking some sense of responsibility and having a long-term vision about what they want their place to be like. Um, and having the means to do it. I think it's about just making the whole process of physical and social change more human. Um, I think people feel so alienated by the place and the, and the distance between them and the people in power. And then it's come back to better together. There are things here which the state and the citizen can do that neither can do on their own. And I'll just say a bit more about that in a moment. Um, and communities are disruptors. We're trying to do things that other people won't do or possibly so most of the innovation in housing, I would say, is actually coming from the community sector right now. Now, I'm just going to do a little bit of sort of slightly boring stuff. This is a community land trust. This is a legal definition of community land trust. And I was really surprised that the um, Labour report um, didn't really mention it. That's one time mention in the footnote. Um, and I think part of this, Labour does have a problem with community land trust. It was in legislation that they authored in 2008 but they really didn't want to accept this amendment. And I'm not entirely sure of that. And it will take up another whole week to discuss this. We won't. But the point about it is that you will not see the words housing or affordable housing anywhere in this definition. Um, so it's not a model of affordable housing. It's a political idea about land ownership in the public interest. That's what it was about. So, a community land trust must be an organisation that's set up specifically to further the economic, social and environmental interests of the local community. Now, it should have said well-being, because then that would exactly replicate the functions of local authorities and also the function of the planning system. The parliamentary trust has said, oh, we can't do that because that's what they do. And we said, but that's what we want to do as well. No, no, it's got to be a trust. Um, Having got your assets, you can only use them for that purpose. And then you have to be an open membership, local organisation, locally accountable. And these are really important. And that's what I'm trying to do is you're trying to change the way the land market works in your area. Central government and local government never try to do this. So who are we doing this? We have to give ourselves some kind of legitimacy to make that possible. If you look at the way the government did it, so shortly after this, that was in 2008, 2011, we had the Localism Act, uh, the government's attempt to devolve more to the communities. Um, parliamentary Blossom had been really, really tricky with that CLT definition. They had to come up with a different definition of an organisation that could promote community life building, which is basically an organisation that gives itself a planning permission for the scheme. Um, and, uh, which is, um, apart from the words interest and well-being, it's exactly the same. So some of the parliamentary the office thought, oh, isn't it? Um, this is a government-sponsored thing, and you'll notice that there have only been about three or four community members since 2011. Um, 
Neil was talking a lot about democracy. Um, I think this is really important. Uh, Rory Stewart is now in the prisons, but he's in a rural uh, constituency in Cumbria where there are a lot of community land trusts. And he's written very thoughtfully about the state of our democracy and how impoverished it is. Um, uh, he's saying there is no power anywhere, really. Um, so we have to reinvent new localised institutions for participation. Uh, Lisa now be probably regretting she got into that particular pose. <laughs> yeah. um, also saying putting people back in control. This means there is just not one right way of doing things. And I would have to say, um, uh, bear in mind where I am, um, is that sometimes dealing with local authorities, there is a very strong sense that theirs is the right way. And doing things in different ways is not really what they want to do. Um, and yet, you can see that start project is that the mayor has now got another 400 homes that he wouldn't have otherwise had. That's a really big game for the political system. So my kind of plea is politicians and citizens working together can do amazing things. There are some problems, um, issues that do need to be dealt with at a very practical level. First four of these are all about money and access to land. Um, crucially, the power of established corporate interests, as Neil was talking about, and uh, people who think, you know, what communities do get getting involved in this stuff. This is what we do. Um, and I think also this very distinct political reserve about what I call the personalization of action, the basic needs. People coming together and say, we want to house ourselves, but you're not on the waiting list. Um, so I think there's a real political conundrum there, but how do you square um, those particular things? So my kind of thought about this is, our homes are not your assets. I think I'd like to say to the bankers and those people is, we are not your assets. So I'm going to get this all to me. <laughs> are you going to fight to ensure you do not become one of their assets? Yes! And we will <laughs> <win. Yes. laughs> Will you fight? Yes! And, and we will fight, will fight with you! you.
I think we've got to listen a lot more. I think we've got to um, think about the language we use, listen more, and genuinely try to co-design and co-produce things in a genuine way. I think for too long people have had things done for them. I think you've got to get down and double and start to actually listen and engage with people before you can start to think you more. I've nothing more to say, oh, let's get, this is a problem for you, let's go. I, I would put a parallel with the common real movement in Scotland, which is a citizens movement. And that, that, that was an amazing um, uh, movement that helped with the, the help independence from common movement. It's a progressive movement for a lot of aspects of Scotland and Scotland. But what common real did really cleverly, it, it spent a lot of time just going into communities. It was academics, it was middle classes, it was think tanks, it was politicians who said, we're well, nobody prejudged stuff here. We're going to get out there and start to do stuff. And so they mobilised lots of people. I went to a town hall meeting in Tindra, which is made from a in Scotland. There was like 300 people there. Do you mean? It's a particular issue. So there's something about the means of how we engage is still very important. And listening, I think, is a, is a key start point for that. I, I think it's important not to overstate the kind of class. Um, and I think there are, there are two things I want to say about that. One is, that for housing as an issue, we've got very used to the idea that we have to rely on the space for the market. Yeah, that's those are the binary choices we've got. Um, the um, National International Network got a, um, a doctoral student to do some research on the street. She was doing, working on system design. How do people get, if they want to do a community housing, how do they find that? How do they go through the process? Um, and one of the things she just did was to go out on the rush hour on uh, commuter line stations all around London and ask people, mm -hmm. what are you looking for yeah. in your housing? And she said, lo and behold, they want all the things that you're looking for. They've got no idea who you are. They've got no idea who you exist. They don't even know if it's a possible choice. So just raising the awareness that there are other ways of doing this is really important. And I think, to be fair, um, this government and the last have done you know, a not too bad job in doing that and making it a bit more uh, of a political issue with self bill and custom bill. We're getting the idea across, and there are quite a few MPs in Parliament on all sides who are saying house builders are just so diminishing our choices that we have to encourage other ways of doing it. But the other thing, and it comes back to my point about community housing, community organizing, is that organisations like London Citizens. They have lots of member organisations. That's how they're based. They're a federation of other civil society organisations, which will be schools, trade unions, uh, mosques, churches, places where all sorts of people from all walks of life meet. Um, and the work that they do is to conduct listening campaigns, hear what concerns people, and then try to turn those into campaigns which they can take to business and politics, um, but crucially, then educating people in their community, to be their community leaders, to lead on these things from an informed perspective. And in London, they have, they decide, they've done two things. One, um, uh, historically, was the London Living Wage. So, members of all these different organisations, <coughs> they have key priority. We're not paid enough to live in London. So the London Living Wage campaign is born, uh, develops into a campaign that takes to employers, sways them to employ, pay their worst proper wage so they could do in London, they don't have to do maybe they have to do two jobs or only three or four. Um, and uh, it was very effective. And then when it was going, they could take that to the mayor and to other politicians and say, we want you to endorse this. Now politicians would never have started a campaign. They would never have gone to business and saying you need to pay your people now. But communities and citizens can do this. And then they can get the state to endorse it. And now it's accepted right across London. Um, local authorities and GLA, people work for them, they have to pay them. Um, and it's now a kind of badge of honour for many businesses to be shown to be a living wage employer. Um, when it gets commandeered by central government, they turn it to something else. It's not separate, but that's another story. And housing is the same. So London System started off um, with a wrong campaign, and it goes back to the Crucially, they were saying that people should be able to afford a home 
paying no more than a third of their money. Um, and the model they came up with was um, an ownership model where you own um, a mortgage, you have a mortgage on your home, you own 100% of your home, but the price you pay is only based on a third of your income, depending on how many people in your household are owning. And that's the basis on which you sell it as well. So you might buy a home um, for £140,000, a one-bedroom flat, um, but the money you'll get back when you sell will be based on how much income is the business and not how much the housing market is the business. Now, can you imagine any politician of any party, the Greens possibly accepted, saying, we've got this great idea, you can buy a house, but you're not going to make any money on it. Um, not a great political winner. But the citizens say, this is what we want. The things we're interested in, the security and certainty of our outcomes. That's all we want. We don't want to make money. But all the things that Rebecca was talking about, your children in the local school, got a local doctor, you know your neighbours, those are things. And citizens can do this. And I think that way of engaging people from a much broader social spectrum through those member institutions is probably one of the best ways. So if you're thinking about um, trying to start a group, and even if you are a middle class people starting off, go to all the other institutions in your area and find you know, people joining clubs and all sorts of things, all walks of life. Find those people and bring them in and get them talking about life. Can I say one more thing very quickly? I think we've got to be very careful. We've got to be very careful when there's different housing markets across the country and um, <laughs> that we shouldn't throw the baby out of the bathwater. I think you know, community-led housing has a role to play. But so does just so does council housing, yeah. And the problem is that councils are not building enough housing, uh, and that, that means there's not enough housing subsidy to do so. So I think we need to be plural in all its forms and not just focus on one particular thing. And, it, and, and the problem we've got of housing, the, 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 the big solution will be councils building more social housing. And I think it's interesting that the start campaign, they started off thinking we've got to find a way of being developed. Yeah, 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 really yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's got to the stage it has got a new council, Labour Council in Haringey. They said, well, we'd like to buy completed homes on this development. And then we've got the City of Corporation who also have to build affordable homes to meet their male targets. They say, well, we'll buy some affordable homes too. So you are beginning to get people saying, we can create council housing on this estate. Somebody needs to build it because we don't have the resources to do that. But we'll buy them. Perspective from the Manchester end of the country. Hi, I want to ask a rather practical question around this. Could I ask you to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Nigel Owens. I am. Um, <coughs> I work for MAC, which is our chief sector infrastructure organisation for Manchester. I'm also a resident of Chalton. South Manchester. Um, a rather practical question, which is, uh, I was speaking to a chief executive of a housing association about a month ago, who was saying that they wanted to build more social housing. The problem was that they couldn't afford the land. And the reason they couldn't afford the land was that London investors are now investing in Manchester because the returns are much greater. They're now up to 8% in Manchester, uh, which is a fantastic way to return on capital at the moment. So my rather practical question is, where do we get the money? Where do residents or communities or anyone else get the money to purchase the land? Yep, yep, yeah. I'll, I'll take it, I'll take three questions and I'll It's the commons. 
it, 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 it's there. And there's certain bits of our cities and our places that need to be seen as the commons and treated in that way. And that's taken it out of the aggressive uh, market that sees land speculation in that way. And it's, it, where you start with, I think you can see, and it's happening uh, a bit in, in London, in the London of Islam, trying to buy land and property to kind of slow the juggernaut down. I would, I would think that the combined authority, if it was supported properly in Greater Manchester through subsidy from the state, should start to buy up land and keep them in perpetuity as commons for the people for their use. But if they're going to do that, they will still nevertheless have to buy it. Um, and so one of, the, one, of the, one of the bits of the slaying the juggernaut is saying um, we've had a period of about 20, 25 years now in which the property market has been driven primarily by the available of uh, huge amounts of debt finance. Um, uh, actually, in this market, that's becoming more and more difficult. Um, and it's very interesting how many developers, both here in Manchester and in London, are turning to um, build to rent because they can access a wholly different sorts of funding, longer term equity funding. Um, and although in the short term, it still means that those investors are having to meet the expectations of land price that's driven by short term debt financing. The thing is that you can then pay for that over 50, 60, or even more years if you choose. So it is a way you can get sufficient weight of equity money into the market, you could begin to have a dampening effect on the way in which um, land is traded, not least because that land isn't coming back onto the market anytime soon. Um, and you know, I, was, I had a meeting this morning with a German uh, investment bank, um, and they're saying, we could help you, at the moment you're entirely dependent on getting some kind of soft deal for one way or another on public land or something like that. Um, or you're part of the Section 106 requirement. So you're getting some kind of discount against the money. They said, there are investors who don't want their money back for 60 years. Um, <coughs> we could help you buy the land. Um, and you have two of them. You can, you can kind of securitize it. So somebody buys the land, somebody helps you raise the money for the bricks and mortar, that amortizes over quite short term periods. Um, your income is still continuing to flow, you can pay for your land over a much, much longer period. But I agree with, with Neil, in the longer term, we have to have a wholly different way of thinking about land being a common good. And that is why, in our own pathetic little way, that definition is really important. It's the only thing on the statute book which describes in any sense at all land being held as a common good. I mean, Sorry, it's a, a really good point, and um, it made me think that it seems to me this is where planning comes in, and, and there's, um, it seems to me that if there's land and there's valuable land that's seen for particular purposes, there's no reason why kind of legislation that says a maximum price for that land. You know, I think it's got that serious in terms of the very nature of this land, yeah, this country. We need to intervene quite deeply in the market to make the market not rigged in favour of speculators, but rigged in you know, a, fair, a fair game here. That needs maximum price legislation for certain parts of land. Mm. And it has to be. You know, this is the time. We're in this interregnum. It's time to go over this sort of stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name's Jo Bird. I helped to co-found Equinox House and Co-op in Longside in the 90s. And now I'm project managing uh, this project, which is which chairs the Greater Manchester Co-op and Community-Led <coughs> Housing Project. Um, the, we're we're um, asking, offering for four things. We want, we want um, to support groups. We've got some money from the Greater Manchester Combined Authority to provide direct support for cooperatives and housing, community-led housing groups that uh, want to move forward. Particularly if you if you want to move forward fast, we're here to accelerate and to, to remove barriers. And then, so secondly, we're looking for experienced advisors. We have some who want more experienced advisors who've got some of the know-how because we've done some of the process already before ourselves. Um, so we can help remove barriers, we can get you registered, um, we can help to find land, and also we can help you to access uh, funding and new money. There's some new money funds um, from Homes England to support
for community-led housing that can uh, do pay for feasibility studies. It can also, in the future, pay for actual purchase of land and property. Um, uh, there's the Housing Investment Fund from Greater Manchester that can help with development finance as well. Thirdly, we're looking for uh, coordination and administration support. So if you're interested in part-time work in this, uh, do let me know. All the details are on the flyer. And fourthly, we'd like um, photos of your community-led housing with you know, photos of people and places and we'll, we'll pay money for that as well. So please do talk to me or get in touch with the contact details. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Phil Chesterton, my resident, that's all. Um, do you think the word affordable has been devalued to the point where it's actually hampering discussions? And what would you do to replace it yourself? Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's two yeses. Um, uh, and Sam Wheel and the Labour Council of Piccadilly, which is the eastern half of the city centre. So uh, I can't afford to live there, so I live in Gorton, um, which is where I'm from. Um, but it was partially linked to Phil's question. So the affordability level in Manchester is £750 a month. Anything less than that is counted as affordable. Um, and I haven't got to stage where it, it, it's just not useful as a term um, when we're talking about affordable housing. Um, and also, I want to build some council housing. How can I do it? Thank you. Okay, shall we take one more question? Is a different question, is that okay? Or is it in relation to this point you want? Um, I can come back if you want, but we've done that one. I'll we'll ask it now then, okay. Um, it's just partly following on from what I heard from Joe there as well, and also the other speakers. Uh, my name is Steve Goslin, and I'm part of a group called the Chalkley Community Led Housing Group, which is getting started really. And um, one of the things I'm interested in is that whole issue of engaging with people around what's important about where they live. Mm. And it may be to Joe this, and our, our, our perhaps other speakers may want to come back on that. It's just the idea of getting started on that and raising issues, raising awareness really about this is an important conversation that you could make a difference to your own life if you, if you engage in it. I quite like the standing on the railway station idea, but I just wonder if that's something which we could look to from the new hope to, to give us some sort of highs, high, you know, some sort of tips of getting started and sharing some ideas around it. Getting the conversation going really is the question. Yeah. Yeah, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the right affordable thing, uh, yeah, affordable seems to be a bit, a bit silly. I think we need to get back to uh, rent control and fair rent pricing. Uh, that's the, that seems to be the way to go um, in terms of, you know, in each area will be different and I think we need to set what a fair rent would be. Um, in terms of we would afford uh, uh, to build housing, I think that clearly in the absence of government not having proper housing subsidy as there, as there is actually in Scotland, we need to look very, very seriously at section 106 and other types of developer input and how we extract more from them. Um, it seems to me we've got very few tools to extract some of that wealth. I think we need to build more vociferous. Um, I do know that in some local authorities, particularly areas that are not that buoyant, uh, there's a suspension of all that sort of developer dividend in the basis because they're scared the developers will run away. Um, so I think there needs to be a whole review of when there is development and there is return being made, what would be fair return and how do we get the local state to extract that wealth, which then in turn would be used to uh, uh, build uh, housing at a fair rate. I mean, politically, there is very great reluctance to have anything like rent control. Um, and the politicians seem to be very enthralled to um, the Landlords Association saying it will you know, turn people off renting and rest. What's going to happen to the houses? They're still going to be there. Someone's going to live in them. Sure. But it, it's kind of feels a really silly argument. And politicians are not being strong enough to kind of call it out. Just going back to my kind of London CLT experience, having devised that uh, purchase price and resale price mechanism that's strictly limited to income, um, it's interesting that 
the GLA, having you know, viewed community housing as a bit of a kind of oddity and a bit left field, um, uh, in the mayor's <coughs> current program, they have devised something called the London Living Rent, which draws partly from the idea of the London Living Wage, <coughs> and also from the idea of not paying more than a third of your household income, which used to be an old-fashioned rule of thumb for council housing. The problem is, the deal they had to strike with government was that although somebody could start by renting at a third of their income, um, after 10 years, the house had to be bought. Um, and this was a deal in exchange for getting additional resources to go into housing in London. And you see politicians have to make these compromises. Nobody has any idea how it would actually work in year 10. There have been lots of attempts to do this in the past, converting rent to mortgage um, at a given date. And of course, you can never guarantee that people will be in a position to buy their homes after 10 years. Uh, life changes happen. Um, partners split up. They can no longer got the means. All these things happen. And so every transaction becomes an individual tale of hardship and difficulty. It, you're on a political road to nowhere trying to make these things work. Um, and you know, the, the other problem is that housing associations are reckoning that they discount the price for 10 years, but they're assuming that whatever happens, that house will go out into the market. Either the occupier will buy it, or they'll turn the occupier out, and somebody else will buy it. So the price they pay at the front end for the land is almost exactly the same as they would if they were buying to develop it and sell it now. So the government gains nothing for all the clinical subsidy. It's complete. But it's interesting that they borrowed that idea I would say directly from the work of London citizens, both on the London living component and the and setting the, uh, the housing cost at the household income. I mean, that's not a unique measure, but um, when I was at college, it was a kind of standard universal uh, measure or the sensible amount of money that people would be paying on their housing costs. Um, I think to the, the getting people involved. Um, I think it, getting people together around almost the same thing is simply a way of starting conversations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, put the tables out in your street once a month, get people to come along and share their food, um, and start talking about the things that are important. Um, I think it, it really is difficult, um, but people in local authorities often find it really difficult because they think that there are you know, methodologies that employ expensive consultants is actually the easiest thing to get people to start on talking, provide them with a kind of social setting, um, and just find out what's important to people, and then very quickly identify the gender, and then you've got something to work with. It's like the, the listening campaigns. What is the most thing that's most important? What's worrying you most? Um, go for it. Have, have fun. It's got to be fun, because otherwise people won't come. I just think, I think this, housing, everything's connected, isn't it? I don't want to get into too complex, but it seems to me that there's something about, is, house, is housing an investment in to create productive people and to create good society? Or is it an investment that's got to play within the market and the economy? It seems to me that we need to think about housing as part of a, of a, as part of an investing in people's lives to be to be productive within the economy, <coughs> but it's actually part of that whole thing. It's seen as a kind of commodity, um, and also in terms of like you know the whole housing issue, it kind of goes back to like wages and how much wealth people have in people's pockets. It's in the sense that people have more money in their pockets, then they can afford different types of rent. Mm. So Neil, you, you talked about the need obviously for um, more social housing and state provided housing in addition as well. Kind of major need.
how, to what extent could it be seen as simply passing on responsibility for governance and maintenance of, of assets, common assets, onto unpaid local residents who have other demands on their time? Because a lot of the time it's the two facing against each other, so to what extent is it, as housing potentially part of the answer of creating more social housing? I mean, from a practical policy point of view, I mean, you know, from a practical sense, where do you start? There's always an interesting question for me in terms of um, where to begin to try and create social progress and change. And it seems to me that community asset transfer, particularly, is one of those ones that seems like a good idea, um, but in an era of austerity um, and in an era of um, where it actually becomes a, a, a means to pass the buck. Yeah. So it seems like a good idea, but actually, because of the context, it's that in the wrong place. So until we have a recognition that housing is a necessity, and until we recognise that as a nation we need to invest in housing, and that might require subsidy to a large some extent, we're kind of dancing on the head of a pin if we come in at it and we sort of um, small-scale stuff. It will become, it will go rogue. It will become, it will become uh, contorted. So, in terms of where you start, I think it needs to be that first recognition, and it needs to be pushed from below in terms of movement. And it's saying we need to start looking seriously at housing as an investment and seeing it as a necessity and as part of what we are as a good society. How do we get more subsidy for council housing, for community housing, for, for community-led housing, for a whole range of different plurality of forms? That's the battle we're at right now. It's like. Stephen thought, what do we need to skewer? The skewer is the idea that housing needs to play um, dance on the top of a, a rampaging, rapacious economy yeah, that doesn't work for people. We need to skewer that first, it seems to me. Otherwise, we'll, we'll end up in a, we'll end up in a, a elastoplastic short-term fixes that will fail. In community asset transfer across the UK, I think uh, um, there's been some good examples, but by and large, it's passing the buck. Not to say that there aren't lots of development trusts doing amazing things for the well-being. 
in the work unit. But they're not quite necessarily uh, democratic, and therefore part of the power structure of those entities, as I think they could. But I think the, the focus from global distribution isn't going to happen. Um, let's concentrate on this uh, community asset transfer, keep a lot of people happy and very occupied and complicated public transactions. It's a bit of a soft. Um, I'll probably get really um, pretty schooled by people in the world of trust for this, but uh, that's what I think. Um, I think it's a great missed opportunity, and um, I think it's really important. So there's things that both Rory Stewart and Lisa Mann are talking about, is we have to invest new local institutions of democratic accountability. So they're not local, uh, local authorities, but they are about participating in democracy to do things that are important. I do that. I think there's sort of balance here. It's a very important point, I think, in that there's something quite ironic. I was, I was brought in a tiny house in a part of a landed estate, and then I went to a council house uh, for 10 years. And, uh, I think we need to understand that the very rich don't really get involved in the... Uh, they just get somebody else to buy a house for them, and then they get somebody else to move in the house, and they've got that house, and it's all paid for. It's all sorted. Yeah. I don't really see why the poorest members or people that, you know, some people just want a house. Why do they have to get involved to have a house? So we need to watch and we can begin to get a balance right here. I think people should have a house. They can get involved if they want to set up a community led house so if they want to do that. But some people won't. And I think the fund the most would just like give us a house at a decent price. Yeah. I don't want to get involved. I'm too busy watching the football and going to the pub. Right? Or doing something else. Right? So I think there's something about it's a right to have a house, and I don't think we should force people necessarily to go down a community. Folk, you've got to get involved in this. Yeah, I think that's unfair. I think we need to get back to a situation where a house like this, I think you get by you're allowed to have it and you'll get involved. <laughs> Um, my name is Nancy Martin. I'm um, a member of Manchester Urban Co-housing, which is an older people's co-housing group in Manchester. Um, and I think one of the issues for us as older people um, is that a house is not just bricks and mortar, and it's not something that we... Um, it's not the only thing we need. Um, we um, see ourselves as active citizens and we have ambitions and aspirations for the next 30 years of our lives, perhaps, maybe more, if we're lucky, yeah. um, to um, play roles in our communities which we are already playing and continue to do so. And what we're looking for is the opportunity to live in a way which enables us to support each other and to develop services for ourselves and for a wider community within our local area. And the bringing together process, which you talked about, is something that we're trying to do in order to do that through the um, co-housing model. And um, we've been going now for five years, um, and we are in South Manchester, which is Boomtown. Um, property prices are rocketing. I don't live in Chalton, I live in the other bit that's getting very expensive. And um, there isn't much land, and the property developers um, are getting in there before us, and despite our working relationships with housing associations, who I have to say vary considerably. Some of them have got a very narrow view and are very, particularly the ones managing ex-council stock, who, who have a very patronising view of older people, who want to care for us. We don't want to be cared for, we want to live our lives. <laughs> and that may involve getting care. And we think we can probably get a better um, model of care that is currently or is likely to be in place by the time I get to the evening. Um, so we're stuck in a, um, a difficult position where we have a lot of things in place, 
but we need more. And particularly, it was the issue that Nigel talked about at the back about to doing something about getting access to land, which is in the right place because of the concept in the housing world of aging in place. I've lived in my house for 35 years. I don't want to live miles and miles away just because I happen to be old and want to live in a particular way. Um, and most of the people in the group are in the same position. So I think it's a complicated issue but in one level, but another level is a very simple issue because it could become quite a radical solution, not just for owner-occupiers, which I am, but for people who want rented accommodation, which we want to incorporate, which also complicates the thing because people can't get their head around managing two models in the same space. Um, so I just wonder whether anybody in the room has got any um, answers to the simple questions about how do we get the right land in the right place? I'll pay money for it. <laughs> our conversation one to one on this question as well but some groups do need land and property and I think there's three sources one is publicly owned land and property a uh, Greater Manchester Combined Authority knows of thousands of plots of land that it already owns and is some of which it will be looking to sell to community led groups um, and not necessarily sell at market rents even so that social uh, when social value can be added the price can be cheaper and um, there's privately owned land and property and s some of whom some are already approaching this project so we hope to broker um, uh, conversations with people who want to sell a house that they no longer want all the property land to a community led group um, and um, third sector owned land and property so uh, churches apparently are working with shelter to look at um, land that they can release 
to community led groups for, for, so, for social and affordable housing. <coughs> I'm not sure whether the questions are based on the one you originally asked because we seem to be free flowing so far. Just they've been a couple of things are coming on what um, was said earlier about the Upload Manchester and Salford Councils. Well, I know it's the system, but I do think Manchester and Salford Councils have not resisted it as well as some others. And maybe Salford's changing a bit at the moment. I hope Manchester will soon, but we have had the massive investment of you know money from the Far East, etc. And that's been encouraged. Richard Lees goes to Cairns and woos the. Uh, you know, the Middle Eastern investors, you know, Manchester's paraded and Salford was, I don't know if it still is, as the place to come. And you look, you know, we've got the donut effect, we had the report out last week, that none of it's helped your average person. It's just helped the investors and a few people who can afford them. And there must be zillions of empty flats, as well as the ones that are used by party weekends, etc. It's not a healthy housing situation from any point of view. So I think you know, would they have some responsibility and they have not used it well. But my question was, going back to something that was said early on by one of the speakers, about, um, you know, hospitals having some sort of responsibility. And I was thinking, um, sorry, I'm Margaret, my name I'm also about now with this community housing thing in Charlton, which is a slightly different thing from what other people might think of as community housing, which is the name we adopted and then we found out there's a whole movement which might or might not be the same as what we want to do, but I am interested in lots of aspects of housing, eco housing in particular, but um, the public institutions in Manchester in particular have a responsibility. So you've got the big hospitals, you've got two universities, the Royal College of Music, maybe some other colleges, who skew the housing market in a lot of ways. You know, the students take over certain areas, they build student flats, but they've also, in building their campuses, taken over, especially MMU recently, a whole chunk of Hume that was social housing, so they've had very cheap land. So I think what we need to do is get them as part of their community responsibility, because they, as we know from the groups that are here, universities have lots of departments doing research projects on you know, age-friendly living and this research and that research, but when it comes to them as an institution, do they think of putting the money where the mouths are? Well, up to now it doesn't seem so. You know, they, I mean, that development where the BBC was, I don't know who actually owns it, whatever, but that's all going to be the student land, from what I can gather. Well, why should it be? You know, what's wrong with it? What would have been wrong with some of that being for, you know, the people who would have otherwise lived in Hume or somewhere like that? So I think, you know, one way or another, these institutions, have, I know they're private, independent, blah, 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 but, you know, they are still public in a way that, you know, Amazon isn't, shall we say. So I think we ought to use, to get to them as well and say you have a responsibility to the community, you want to be seen as, you know, people and not just businesses, or some of them do, some of them probably don't, and therefore try and get them to take some responsibility on what's going on in the area as a whole and not just their own narrow interests in housing the students and, you know, teaching the students and whatever it is that, you know, that they're involved in at the moment. Yeah, that was a lovely comment. Excellent. Uh, I, I agree. I think the council saw for Manchester other ones could have done a lot more. I, I think it was like started off all this back in the eighties. I think where uh, where Manchester the city was, where they adopted an urban entrepreneurialism to make themselves friendly to capital investment. It was a, maybe possibly not a bad idea then in terms of where Manchester was. It's just that they held on to that idea too long. It seems to me. And when it started to become more boring, it should have turned around and actually looked more at social and economic justice. In my view, they've been a bit late, but I think there's an opportunity now to start to change that, and I think they are changing, maybe a bit of a juggernaut, super tanker. But I think it, it, maybe it was a necessity of some of that, that, that you know, civic boosterism they did, yeah? But we're past that now. It's, it ended up like some mini sort of London. The agglomeration of economics went too far, and I think they don't want to make the mistake of London. Uh, I think sometimes we kind of manage to to eat one that we not have more social justice, uh, social justice frame to our land and property and development. And that's what we should be doing as a progressive city. But, uh, uh, on the on the public institutions and the universities, I completely agree with you. Uh, if you look at the universities, uh, certainly the big ones in this city region, oh, name them, University of Manchester. It talks big, big, you have its corporate social responsibility. Yeah, 
and it's got and it does a lot of good philanthropic stuff in terms of uh, work with the community voluntary sector. But the real levers it can pull, yeah, it's land and property and investments, yeah. What's it doing with that, yeah, in terms of to benefit the poorer, poorer parts of the city? There's academics in those institutions who took it a big view heart being progressive, but they're not really getting at the vice chancellor or influence the deans about how they should be conducting. They're very well being politically right on, yeah, in, in their academic papers, but are they really getting right into the entrails of the exploitative speculative practices of their own institution? So I completely agree with you. The Lighting universities, like the University of Birmingham, for instance, would be doing some work. Um, the vice chancellor's well behind this sort of stuff in terms of wealth building and the, the Birmingham for being a virtuous thing. Um, I'm not really sure the university is in this sector, certainly like, you know, the Manchester in that space. I mean, I think there's, a, there's one good example of a university doing that. So UCL in London um, was going to UCL. UCL in London, I think it's called. Um, was going the State Department were going to buy a council estate of Newham Council that is on the edge of the Olympic Park in order to build a new campus at Stratford. Um, this is called the Carpenters Estate, and if you Google Car Carpenters Estate, you'll see this has been a battle going on between the community and the UN Council, and the Labour prevented a much missed mayor, Robin Wells. Um, by some. By some. <laughs> um, uh, trying to enter this estate over the best part of 15 years and never quite succeeded. Um, and yeah, so there the, were then academics and indeed students. Um, in the planning school, who were completely horrified at this, because basically the university was doing exactly the thing that all the teaching was saying should never happen. Um, and in the end, that kind of pressure told, and you know, the university withdrew. But in a sense, it was not evil intent. It was simply that the property people had no idea of what these sensitivities were. To them, it was just another bit of real estate. Um, they have lots of money to spend because they sit on a pile of real estate in a very valuable part of central London. So they're completely divorced from the values of the university. And the governance of the university is simply insufficient to make sure that this sort of thing never happens. I think we've got time for one more point. There was somebody with a hand up at the back there. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a bit. Hi, uh, my name is Gauthier. Uh, um, uh, I mean, I've been involved in a few uh, community-led housing projects, mostly with co-ops all over the country. Um, I just wanted to make a comment, like a more of a general comment, um, which I think is relevant to the risk and opportunities of alternative ownership model. Um, it's, it's the fact that when we talk about community-led housing, it's quite a diverse sector with a lot of different models. Um, and, and also that's, um, that's a, you know, we can value the diversity. Um, I also think because we do relate that movement to like the common ownership of assets, to things like affordability, to grassroots control of housing, and grassroots and democratic control of housing, I think it's important to understand how those different models actually lead to different social implications. And, yeah. Where it's good to kind of value the diversity, I think we should not so fall into the trap of using any kind of model that at the moment are under the umbrella of community led housing because I think we've been through a phase of experimenting with new models um, and there are particular models of yeah, ownership and governance which do guarantee um, like long term affordability, that do guarantee grassroots and democratic control of housing by, its, by the occupants. Um, and also mostly that prevent any form of financialization of, uh, of housing assets. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I kind of think we should try to really understand which model should be promoted depending on what aim we are in. Because there's a variety, there's a difference between um, you know, privately owned co-housing models than say cooperative co-housing models. And that leads to a second slide comment is that um, like across the board when I work with other community-led organizations, um, we often compare things like co-ops or community land trusts with something like co-housing. Um, 
And you know, because the area is so diverse, I think we need to be clear about our messages. And actually, talking about commute, like co-housing is actually about the physical, um, the physical aspect of the housing project, is how housing are placed together. Whereas something like co-ops and community land trust is about the ownership and governance of the property and the land. And actually, you know, a, a co-housing project isn't something on its own. It's a co-housing is going to be either incorporated as a co-op or a CFT or privately owned. But I think we, it's quite important to start to clearly make those differences when we talk about community led housing. Thanks, Gautier. I think that was a really good point to, to, to end on. Um, we, the Housing Futures project is, is looking at all of the different forms of PT housing and trying to make sense of them for an audience of people who are interested in, making, in reforming the housing sector in, in, in Manchester, in the place of Manchester. Um, and we're trying to see like what models, what to lay out, what, what exactly all of these models mean and, and, and how, they could, how they could work in, in Manchester. At the same time, we're like bringing people together who have this knowledge and expertise and interest. Um, through the network, and I think gradually we'll start to see like where uh, initiatives can <coughs> support one another and, 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 and gradually spread this awareness we've been talking about to different communities, communities that are currently not thinking in terms of housing as a solution to some of the wider problems um, that they're facing, economic and social problems that, um, that, that we're facing as, as a city region. Um, but start to see how kind of more democratic control can come into the housing aspects of our lives. Um, but also, as we've seen today, like, kind of covered all of the issues and problems with um, the housing market. And um, I think the Greater Manchester Housing Action, which works on this cares about homelessness and um, asset stripping and all, all of the all of the things that you know that are making um, life kind of harder for so many people. Um, with this community-led housing topic is kind of one that we've embraced because it has some positive solutions in there and it kind of has some avenues for hope and it kind of, it kind of brings together the, sort of, the um, sort of wider desire that we're seeing in society for greater <coughs> local power and, and empowerment and working together and transfer of ownership to the community. So um, hopefully the conversation we're going to carry on with but, uh, we're going to be looking at um, what, uh, uh, what community-led housing we meet in African countries and in other countries in the global south at our next event because there's so much that we can learn from, from how it works there where it's a really big part of the housing sector. Um, and then our launch event, um, on, on, on when, we, when the report will be finished, um, is, will be like a wider conversation that we'll try to bring back a lot